private sector. Today, a House Government Reform Subcommittee heard from cybersecurity analysts and officials from the General Accounting Office, the Office of Management and Budget, and the Commerce Department. Florida Congressman Adam Putnam chaired the two-hour hearing. Quorum being present, this hearing of the Subcommittee on Technology, Information Policy, Intergovernmental Relations, and the Census will come to order. Good morning, and welcome to a series of planned hearings on cybersecurity, a topic that is uh, critically important and one that has uh, largely been neglected uh, both in congressional debate, private sector action, and, and administrative action. Uh, it's a pleasure to have a distinguished panel of witnesses with us this morning. Virtually every aspect of our lives is in some way, shape, or form connected to computers. Networks that stretch from coast to coast or around the world connect these computers to one another. And in the traditional sense, we have thought of our security as a nation in the physical. Bridges, power plants, water supplies, airports, etc. Securing our physical infrastructures has been a high priority and a particularly visible priority since September 11th, 2001. The military, customs, and border patrol are charged with protecting and securing our borders. The Coast Guard protects our waterways. Federal, state, and local law enforcement officials protect our bridges, railways, and streets and provide for our own personal protection. But in this day and age, this type of one-dimensional thought is no longer adequate. Our critical infrastructure of the cyber kind must have the same level of protection if we are to be secure as a nation from random hacker intrusions, malicious viruses, or worse, serious cyber terrorism. There are several things unique to cyber attacks that make the task of preventing them particularly difficult. Cyber attacks can occur from anywhere around the globe, from the caves of Afghanistan to the war fields of Iraq, from the most remote regions of the world or simply right here in our own backyard, perhaps in the bedroom of some 16-year-old who's particularly gifted in computer and electronics. The technology used for cyber attacks is readily available and changes continuously. And perhaps most dangerous of all is the failure of many people critical to securing these networks and information from attack to take the threat seriously, to receive adequate training and to take the steps needed to secure their networks. I'm happy to say today that all of the witnesses here are on the forefront of this war on cyber terrorism and I'm looking forward to their insightful, terror, to their insightful testimony. In May of 1998, President Clinton released PDD 63. This directive set up groups within the federal government to develop and implement plans that would protect government-operated infrastructures and called for a dialogue between government and the private sector to develop a national infrastructure assurance plan that would protect all of the nation's critical infrastructures by 2003. <clears throat> the directive has... <clears throat> excuse me... <clears throat> The directive has since been supplemented by Executive Order 13231, which established President Bush's Critical Infrastructure Protection Board and the President's National Strategy for Homeland Security. Since January of 2001, efforts to improve federal information security have accelerated at individual agencies and at the government-wide level. For example, implementation of Government Information Security Reform Act legislation, or GISRA, enacted by the Congress in October of 2000 was a significant step in improving federal agencies' information security programs and addressing their serious, pervasive information security weaknesses. In implementing GISRA, agencies have noted benefits, including increased management attention to and accountability for information security. Although improvements are underway, recent GAO audits of 24 of the largest federal agencies continue to identify significant information security weaknesses that put critical federal operations and assets in each of those agencies at risk. On December 17th of 2002, 
the Federal Information Security Management Act, or FISMA, was enacted as Title III of the E-Government Act of 2002. FISMA permanently authorizes and strengthens the information security program, evaluation, and reporting requirements established by GISRA. It's ridiculous, all these uh, acronyms. Among its provisions, it also requires the National Institute of Standards and Technology to develop standards that provide mandatory minimum information security requirements for federal information systems. While securing federal information systems is critical, so is securing the, criti the critical infrastructure of the nation, 80% of which is privately controlled. Reports of computer attacks abound. The 2002 report of the Computer Crime and Security Survey conducted by the Computer Security Institute and the FBI's San Francisco Computer Intrusion Squad showed that 90% of the respondents, mostly large corporations and federal agencies, had detected computer security breaches within the last 12 months, 90%. In addition, the number of computer security incidents reported to the CERT Coordination Center rose from over 9,800 in 1999 to over 52,000 in 2001 and over 82,000 in 2002. And these are, the, these are only the attacks that are reported. The director for CERT centers operated by the Carnegie Mellon University stated that he estimate, estimates that as much as 80% of actual security incidents go unreported. In most cases, this is because either the organization was unable to recognize its systems had been penetrated, or there were no indications of penetration or attack, or the organization was just reluctant to report. Our own GAO has found a disturbing trend among federal agencies. In both 2001 and 2002, GAO continued their analysis of audit reports for 24 major departments and agencies. The audits identified significant information security weaknesses in each that put critical federal operations and assets at risk. While the federal government and private sectors have made improvements in cyber critical infrastructure protection, there is still much work to be done. In July of 2002, GAO identified at least 50 federal organizations that have various national or multi-agency responsibilities related to cyber critical infra infrastructure protection. The interrelationship of these organizations is vital to a successful cyber CIP strategy. These organizations also interrelate and coordinate with even more private sector organizations as well as the state and local governments. The ability of all of these groups to communicate well, to understand the risks involved, accept common goals and minimum standards, and accept full accountability will be the keys to a successful national effort to protect the nation's critical infrastructures and our government networks. This subcommittee accepts the serious nature of the oversight responsibility related to this topic. And this hearing today is simply the beginning of what will be a series of hearings that examine and measure the progress towards achieving true cybersecurity. We're delighted to be accompanied by the gentleman from Missouri, the ranking member, Mr. Clay, and I recognize you for uh, your opening remarks. Thank you for joining us. Good morning, and thank you, Mr. Chairman, for calling this hearing. I'd like to welcome the witnesses who are going to testify before us today. The issue before us today, as the chairman has pointed out, is as critical as any national security issue. Unfortunately, it is even more complex than most. There are really two issues before us today. First, as the title of this hearing implies, we must examine the processes in place for protecting our nation's critical uh, infrastructures like the telephone system, financial systems, the supply of electricity, natural gas, water, and emergency services. Second and equally important, we must examine the security of the computer systems that run our government from day to day. Just, just last November, this committee issued a report on computer security where only three agencies got grades of C or above, and 14 agencies failed. Some of the answers to these questions are the same. Computer security takes place in the trenches. If the man or woman sitting at the desk doesn't do the proper things, then our systems will not be secure. 
If the system administer, administrator doesn't uh, install the proper patches when they become available, then our systems will not be secure. If the procurement officer doesn't examine software for security features before recommending or approving a purchase, uh, then our system will not be secure. All of the security plans in the world will not make our system secure unless those at the heart of the system do their job. As we have learned, computer security has not been a priority at agencies. Over the past four years, Congress has steadily turned up the heat. Our former Representative Horn issued a number of report cards, each one showing that the situation was worse than we re uh, realized. One of the lessons from that experience was that when we ask agencies to evaluate themselves, they are often overly optimistic. Last year, the report cards based primarily on audit reports from the Inspector General uh, was the worst ever. We may have turned the corner. Last year, we passed the Federal Information Security Management Act, known as FISMA, another acronym, uh, which is a significant step forward in setting out requirements for computer security that agencies must follow. Now we must assure that those requirements are implemented. It is my understanding that OMB has yet to issue the guidance required under FISMA. And I hope that uh, Mr. Foreman will tell us that OMB has renewed its efforts to assure that the requirements of FISMA are implemented. We have a long way to go, but I believe that we are on the right track to secure our government's day-to-day -day computer systems. I'm not sure I can say the same thing about protecting our critical infrastructure. While I believe we are making progress in this arena, it is very slow. It has been almost seven years since President Clinton established the President's Commission on Critical Infrastructure Protection and almost five years since President Clinton issued uh, Presidential Decision Directive 63 to assure critical infrastructure protection. I expect our witnesses today will report on how we are progressing towards the goals established in that directive. What concerns me, however, is that we have entered an era where things like critical infrastructure protection and homeland security are being used to erode our open government. Uh, just last week, USA Today reported that we are facing the biggest rollback of open government laws since those laws were passed 30 years ago. What is tragic is that this renewed emphasis on secrecy is unnecessary. In the 19th century, the uh, cryptographer August uh, Kirchhoff, Kirch, Kirchhoff's set down a principle that guides the most advanced work in cryptography today. In good systems, the system should not depend on secrecy, and it should be able to fall in, and it should should be able to uh, fall in the enemy's hands without disadvantage. Put another way, the knowledge that American citizens are going to jump anyone who tries to hijack a plane does more to prevent hijackings than all of the secret plans at the Transportation Security Agency. If we sacrifice the fundamental principles of our society in the name of security, we have won, won neither security nor freedom. Uh, and thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much. At this time, we will uh, begin with our witnesses. Uh, all of you have been very gracious to provide thorough written testimony. As you know, we ask that you limit your oral presentation to five minutes. There is a light box on your table. The green light means that you may begin your remarks. In red, we ask you to begin to sum up because the time has expired. Uh, we do have several witnesses and some panel members who are on a tight time schedule, and we will attempt to be as thorough and as efficient as possible. As you know, this the policy of this committee that we swear in witnesses, so please rise and raise your right hand. And <clears throat> you swear that the testimony you will give before the subcommittee will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you God. I do. Note for the record that all of the witnesses responded in the affirmative. I'd like to begin uh, the, the uh, first panel with Richard Clark. 
Richard Clark is an internationally recognized expert on security, including homeland security, national security, cyber security, and counterterrorism. He has served the last three presidents as a senior White House advisor. Over the course of a record-setting 11 consecutive years of White House service, he has held the titles of Special Assistant to the President for Global Affairs, National, National Coordinator for Security and Counterterrorism, and Special Advisor to the President for Cybersecurity. Prior to his White House years, Mr. Clark served for 19 years in the Pentagon, the Intelligence Community, and the State Department. During the Reagan administration, he was Deputy Assistant Secretary of State for Intelligence. During the first Bush administration, he was Assistant Secretary of State for Political and Military Affairs and coordinated diplomatic efforts to support the first Gulf War and the subsequent security arrangements. Today, Mr. Clark consults on a range of issues, including corporate security risk management, information security technology, dealing with the federal government on security and IT issues, and counterterrorism. Clearly, he is a uh, well-qualified witness uh, for, for this subcommittee hearing, and we're uh, delighted to have you, Mr. Clark. And with that, you're recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, Mr. Clay. Mr. Chairman, first let me start by commending you for having this hearing and recognizing the importance of this issue. Uh, your remarks were right on point. Uh, I'm not surprised that you're uh, on top of this issue. I recall very well that long before September 11th, uh, you asked me when I was the counterterrorism czar to come up and brief you on al-Qaeda before most members of the Congress knew what al-Qaeda was. Uh, so I'm not surprised that you're on top of this issue before other people are. Uh, I would hope that with cybersecurity we could do more to raise our defenses before we have a major disaster. With al-Qaeda, unfortunately, we had to wait uh, until we had a major disaster for people to get it uh, and for people to act on that understanding. It would be nice if for once we were able to get the Congress and the administration and the corporate world to understand the issue before the disaster occurs. The problems that we've had to date in cybersecurity are minor when compared to the potential. And the mistake a lot of people make is that they look at the past as a predictor of the future, that the past $17 billion a year worth of damage by cybersecurity, uh, they think is just a minor nuisance. Unfortunately, as long as we have major vulnerabilities in cyberspace, and we do not address those major vulnerabilities, uh, we run the potential for somebody doing us much more severe damage than has been done to date. So who, people who look at the cost of cyberspace security problems today and say those problems are not significant should instead be looking to the future and what could happen based on the vulnerabilities that exist. Mr. Chairman, I've suggested in my written testimony ten things which I think this committee could do, this committee and the Congress in general. Uh, let me quickly go over them uh, in the time allowed. First and foremost, I think the Department of Homeland Security must be the focus, the location in the executive branch that has clear responsibility for cyberspace security. That is the intent of President Bush's national strategy. Unfortunately, the department in its early days, and I admit these are early days, has not organized itself to take on that heavy responsibility, hasn't created a cyberspace security center, has not recruited senior recognized cyberspace security experts. And until it does, we will continue to have a major problem. Secondly, we still lack a chief information security officer for the federal government. I have the utmost respect for my friend and colleague Mark Foreman, but he is not the chief information security officer. We don't have one. You would think that since Congress has given to OMB by law the responsibility for managing the security, the IT security of the federal agencies, except for the Defense Department and the intelligence community, that they would have a large staff of people dedicated fully to this issue. They do not. And until they do, we are likely to continue to have agencies, uh, 14 agencies getting Fs, 
and no agency is getting better than C. No matter what laws we pass, no matter what acronyms we adopt, FISMA, GIZMA, until there is a clear, full-time, responsible official in the White House with a full-time, responsible staff that is sufficiently large and sufficiently qualified, uh, we will not be able to implement these laws. Third, the Congress passed last year the Cyberspace Security Research Act. Uh, I think it's important that it, that authorization be matched with an appropriate appropriation this year. Fourth, I think the committee ought to look at the mechanisms of the Internet itself, uh, the things which are owned in common, not by the government, not by a particular company, but the, the Internet mechanisms for traffic flow, uh, all of which are highly vulnerable, as was proved by the attack on the domain name system last year. Fifth, I think, rather than asking uh, GAO to do periodic on-site inspections uh, and come up with reports, GAO should be authorized by this committee to buy the devices which are now available uh, to allow auditing and scanning of major enterprises for the 2,800 known vulnerabilities on a daily basis. The technology is deployed in the private sector. It allows companies, CEOs, COOs, on a daily or weekly basis to see every machine in their network and to see whether or not it is fixed, whether or not it is vulnerable. GAO should have that technology, and it should have it deployed in all of the major government agencies. So you, Mr. Chairman, members of this committee, can get a weekly report, a monthly report, rather than having these uh, one-off GAO inspections uh, every year, which are costly and which do not give you the same results uh, as this kind of automated auditing against the 2,800 known vulnerabilities. Sixth, the... Uh, General Services Administration has put into place a patch management system, and as Mr. Clay said, there is a real problem in this government with the lack of people fixing patches. That patch management system is a great place to invest additional dollars. It's the best place where we can invest in order to improve security. Let me stop there, Mr. Chairman, as my time is up. Thank you very much. This time we're uh, pleased to welcome to the subcommittee Michael Vadis. Mr. Vadis is director of the Institute for Security Technology Studies at Dartmouth College and the chairman of the Institute for Information Infrastructure Protection, or I3P. ISTS is a principal national center for research, development, and analysis of counterterrorism and cybersecurity technology. I3P is a consortium of major research organizations whose mission is to develop a national R&D agenda for information infrastructure <coughs> protection promote collaboration among researchers, and facilitate and fund research in areas of national priority. Between 1998 and 2001, Mr. Vadis founded and served as the first director of the National Infrastructure Protection Center in Washington, now part of the Department of Homeland Security. The NIPC was the lead federal agency responsible for detecting, warning of, and responding to cyber attacks, including computer crime, cyber terrorism, and cyber espionage. Mr. Vadis has also served in the U.S. Departments of Justice and Defense as Associate Deputy Attorney General and Deputy Director of the Executive Office for National Security. He coordinated the Justice Department's national security activities and advised the Attorney General and Deputy Attorney General on issues relating to counterterrorism, high-tech crime, counterintelligence, and infrastructure protection. He is a graduate of Princeton and Harvard. Welcome. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. It's a pleasure to be here this morning to testify before you and the subcommittee, along with my distinguished colleagues. I would like to wholeheartedly endorse both the substance of your own statement uh, and that of Mr. Clay, as well as uh, my colleague Dick Clark's, because I think all of those uh, statements summarize very well the nature of the problem and where we are today in terms of our capability to deal with an increasingly serious issue. Um, 
I would like to limit my oral remarks today to the part of my written testimony that deals with uh, where I think the principal shortcomings are. Uh, I think it should be simply said that there are many good initiatives going on right now in individual agencies. Uh, GISRA and FISMA, I think, were significant advances uh, on Congress's part in dealing with the problem. But I think we have, in some respects, actually regressed in recent months in our ability to deal with this issue. Um, one of the areas has to do with the fact that uh, with the dismantling of the President's Critical Infrastructure Protection Board uh, and Mr. Clark's former Office of Cyberspace Security in the White House, there is at the moment a serious void in the executive branch's leadership. There is no central locus right now for policymaking and for coordination of uh, efforts across all of the agencies uh, at the high level, at the policy level. And I think that will significantly impede the government's ability to move forward on this issue. Many of the responsibilities that had been carried out by the board, by uh, Mr. Clark's former office, are supposed to be carried out now by the new Department of Homeland Security. But the officials who are supposed to take on those responsibilities have, to my knowledge, not yet even been formally nominated, let alone confirmed. And so that void is likely to, to continue uh, at the leadership level for several months. At the operational level, I think we see a similar void. Uh, many different entities in the government that had some responsibility for cybersecurity, including my former organization, the NIPC, the Critical Infrastructure Assurance Office, uh, FedCERC, uh, all were moved into the Department of Homeland Security on the theory that these, the efforts of these organizations should be consolidated to achieve greater efficiency and effectiveness. The problem, however, is that for at least some of those entities, in fact, the, the consolidation is less than meets the eye. My former organization, the NIPC, was supposed to contribute over 300 uh, of the positions in the new department that would be focusing on both intelligence analysis and infrastructure protection. In fact, though, if you examine what actually occurred, uh, it was a transfer of vacant FTEs, not of actual people, because most of the people stayed at the FBI or found other jobs elsewhere in the federal government. And so, in fact, now DHS has a tall order to fill hundreds of vacancies. And the capabilities that were built up at the NIPC over the five years since its inception have essentially uh, been dismantled or ramped down considerably because of the, the lack of personnel. And so again, given the length of time that hiring uh, of federal employees takes, particularly when you add in the need for background investigations, it, it's my uh, unfortunate view that, that it, it could take uh, over a year before we even get back to where we were in terms of our capability to detect, warn of, and respond across the board to major uh, cyber attacks. The other issue I think uh, needs, that needs um, to be focused on is at the policy level of what the government's policy is with regard to the privately owned critical infrastructures and how to induce greater security of those critical infrastructures. Both the Clinton administration and the, the Bush administration, in my view, have primarily relied on what I call the soapbox strategy. Having officials like Mr. Clark, like myself when I was in the government, like Mr. Foreman, get up on a proverbial soapbox and talk about the seriousness of this problem and urge the owners and operators of infrastructures to take the problem seriously and do something about it. Uh, I think those efforts have been partially successful in raising awareness, in getting more attention focused on the problem. But I think at the end of the day, those efforts are clearly not enough. More needs to be done. And so I would urge this subcommittee to consider some more imaginative and more aggressive approaches. Uh, perhaps regulation modeled after uh, HIPAA for healthcare providers, the Graham-Leach-Bliley Act for financial service companies, uh, and other what I would call softer approaches to incent the marketplace, to create incentives for companies to make more secure products and for owners and operators of infrastructures 
to take security more seriously. And rather than simply saying, we don't want to regulate in the high-tech area, we should at least give serious consideration uh, to measures that would move us beyond the soapbox strategy. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, our next witness is Mark Foreman. Mr. Foreman is the uh, Chief Information Officer for the Federal Government. Uh, under his leadership, the U.S. Federal Government has received broad recognition for its successful use of technology and e-government. He is charged with managing over $58 billion in IT investments and leading the President's e-government initiative to create a more productive, citizen-centric government. He is also the leader in the development and implementation of the Federal Information Technology Policy and is responsible for a variety of oversight functions statutorily assigned to the Office of Management and Budget. He also oversees executive branch CIOs and directs the activities of the Federal CIO Council, as well as chairing or being a member of several key IT-related boards, including the President's Critical Infrastructure Board. To improve results from federal IT spending, Mr. Foreman created a framework that couples cross-agency teamwork and leadership with a government-wide IT budget decision process built around a results-driven modernization blueprint. Uh, Mr. Foreman is a frequent witness before the subcommittee, and his uh, insight is always very helpful, and we are delighted to have you again with us this morning. Welcome. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, good morning. Uh, I want to uh, take a moment just to commend Dick Clark on what I think is a truly outstanding career in public service that he's, as you know, recently retired from. Uh, I think his career serves as really a benchmark uh, for those of us in public service. Uh, clearly, his dedication to the country, the security of Americans is uh, uh, remarkable and outstanding. And, and as an American, personally, I, I just appreciate his service so much. Uh, I want to thank you for inviting me to discuss the status of the federal government's IT security. Cybersecurity is a top priority in the administration's IT and counterterrorism efforts. The challenge, as you pointed out, is to provide the maximum protection while ensuring the free flow of information and commerce and protecting privacy. I'm going to briefly summarize my statement. Uh, first of all, I'm pleased to report to you today that the federal government has made substantial improvements in securing the information and information systems that we protect. Uh, let me do this by explaining the difference between where we were on September 10th, 2001 and where we were one year later in September 2002. September 2001. Only 40% of federal systems had up-to-date security plans. One year later, that was up to 61%. Similarly, the number of federal systems certified and accredited was at 27% in 2001. One year later, that was up to 47%. Number of systems with contingency plans, 30% in September 2001. September last year, 53%. There are other significant improvements, and I had a table with that data in my testimony, written testimony, uh, but items such as agencies using plans of actions and milestones as the authoritative management tool to ensure that program and system level IT security weaknesses are prioritized, tracked, and corrected. These measures reveal in some cases over 50% measured performance improvements since 2001, but they also identify an awful lot of work to be done. The administration plans to make significant progress again this year. In our Klinger Cohen report, which was Chapter 22 of the Analytical Perspectives of the President's 2004 budget, we included targets for improvement in critical IT security weaknesses by the end of this calendar year. Some of the key targets, all agencies shall have, a, shall have an adequate process in place for developing and implementing the plans of actions and milestones to ensure that program and system level IT security weaknesses are identified, tracked, and corrected. 80% of federal IT systems shall be certified and accredited. 80% of the federal government's FY 2004 major IT investments shall appropriately integrate security into the life cycle of their investments. I'd like to talk a little bit about funding. Our analysis for a second year in a row shows that there is not a direct correlation between how much agencies spend on IT security and the quality of their results. 
that said, the spending on IT security has increased 70 percent since 2002. Federal agencies plan to spend $4.25 billion this year on IT security. That's 7 percent of the federal government's overall IT budget and a 57 percent increase from the $2.7 billion spent last fiscal year. In next fiscal year, agencies plan to spend $4.7 billion on IT security, and that will rise to 8 percent of the overall federal government IT budget. I'd like to talk uh, very briefly about some of the improvement in, improvements and changes in handling cybersecurity incidents. Uh, last year when I testified before the Government Reform and Oversight Committee, I pointed out that we need to move to respond to threats within 24 hours, and so we've taken fairly aggressive action to do that. Uh, OMB and the CIO Council have developed and deployed a process to rapidly identify and respond to cyber threats and critical vulnerabilities. CIOs are advised via conference call as well as follow-up email of specific actions needed to protect agency systems when a threat's been identified. Agencies must then report to OMB on the implementation of the required countermeasures. This emergency notification and response process has been used three times since the beginning of the year. And we started out with the, the first vulnerability with a 90-minute cycle time to get the message out and get affirmative contact back that the process had begun. First for the slammer warm, then the send mail and the IIS vulnerabilities. As a result of these early alerts, agencies have been able to rapidly close vulnerabilities that otherwise might have been exploited. I'd also like to talk a little bit about the integration of FedCERC, the National Infrastructure Protection Center, and the Critical Information Infrastructure Assurance Office at Chow under one department. That represents an opportunity for the administration to strengthen the government-wide processes for intrusion detection and response through maximizing and leveraging the important resources of these previously separate offices. Now, this has only been in effect for a little over a month, so I think as they produce the results of their planning, you'll see that there will be significant action. Uh, experts agree, though, and I'd just like to conclude with a final thought. It's virtually impossible to ensure perfect security of IT systems. Therefore, we must maintain constant vigilance while also maintaining the focus, as my colleagues have said, on business continuity plans. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Foreman. I thank you, all of our panelists, and we'll get right to questions. Uh, all of you have touched on the fact the, the simple fact that most of the uh, critical infrastructure is controlled by the private sector. And uh, Mr. Vadis in particular singled out the need for an aggressive, innovative approach that goes beyond merely the soapbox to, uh, to incent or coerce a greater uh, accountability and compliance, a greater focus on cybersecurity in the private sector. Uh, could, could you elaborate a little bit more, beginning with Mr. Vadis and then the other two as well, on, on the best way for the federal government to approach the regulation of and, and the, the incentivizing of, of better cybersecurity in the private sector. Mr. Chairman, thank you. Um, I don't have any particular silver bullet that I think uh, is the, the answer to the problem. Um, but I think there are a number of ideas that have been discussed, but over the past few years have basically been dismissed out of hand, out of the, because of the fear of even getting into anything that might smack of, of regulation. So what I'm really urging is a considered study of several different options. Uh, the fact of the matter is that we do have some instances of direct regulation, of, of coercion, if you will, that are already in place that weren't instituted for security's sake per se, but more out of a concern for privacy, uh, in the example of HIPAA and Graham Leach Bliley, for example. So I think one thing that, that should be done is to study those acts as they're implemented to see if they actually result in a net increase uh, of security, and if so, at what cost, what cost in efficiency or uh, in, in other things. I think there are other ideas that have been talked about, such as requiring disclosure uh, of security plans or security breaches by companies that 
uh, that suffer breaches so that there is a further incentive to take security seriously. Because what we've seen over the years again and again and again is many companies simply sweeping the problem under the rug uh, and so that it doesn't become public. And I think if there were some sort of disclosure requirement, as the state of California, for example, is now requiring for companies that do business in that state, uh, as of this summer at least, that could create an additional uh, incentive. Requiring disclosure of plans in, in a 10K form for publicly traded companies is another idea that has been talked about. Uh, tax incentives uh, for the uh, upgrading of technology um, to address security uh, is uh, another idea. Best practices for, for hardware and software manufacturers. So there are many ideas, and I think um, the, the wonderful staff, uh, congressional staff that are, that are out there are a good resource to look into these ideas. I think some of the federal R&D monies should be devoted not just to technical R&D, but to uh, research into the legal policy and, and economic factors that affect the implementation of technical security requirements. So I think those are some of the, the things that I would urge. Mr. Clark. Mr. Chairman, I think we want to avoid regulation here. Um, the, the thought of having a federal cybersecurity regulation agency and the federal cybersecurity police scares me to death. Uh, but I think there are some things we can do to stimulate the private sector uh, without regulation. Uh, one, Michael just mentioned, um, we can have the SEC uh, do what it did for Y2K, which is to require that publicly traded companies have in their reports uh, a report against some set of auditing standards that the auditing industry could come up with, uh, a report on their performance. Now, we don't want their security plans revealed publicly, and we don't want them to have to report individual incidents. But they ought to get a grade from an outside auditing firm, IT security auditing firm, and that ought to be reported as part of their public annual disclosure. That had a great effect during Y2K, uh, and we ought to think seriously about asking the SEC to look into that. Uh, similarly, uh, cyber insurance could have a big effect. The insurance industry could set standards uh, for cyber security insurance, and the rates that they charge could reflect how good a company is doing. Uh, requiring certain kinds of companies that are doing business with the federal government, not small businesses, but larger businesses, to have cyber security insurance would have an enormous effect on the market. But before we go to Mr. Foreman, let me follow up on that. I'll wait till the buzzer finishes. <coughs> you mentioned in, in part of your 10-point plan in your testimony that the need for any congressional action on terrorism risk insurance to include a cyber insurance provision. Presumably that would be have some type of federal backstop at some point in, or subsidy in that risk insurance and and you mentioned that that, that, that alone would raise the bar of uh, of security on on the cyber side but you you differ from Mr. Vadis in saying that they should not companies should not have to report breaches of security Could, why is that uh, i don't think you want to uh, have specific breaches of of security reported because i think it gives too much information to the people who want to do the breaches uh, i think what you want is an overall grade all too often uh, when there's one minor security violation uh, that gets into the press because it's been reported. Uh, a company suffers disproportionately from what its real security problem is. Uh, so I don't think you want to have to force companies to report individual security violations, but to report an overall grade on performance. Uh, the Cyber Risk Insurance Act, of course, has passed. Uh, the committee language suggests it covers cyber security. That's not clear in the language of the bill. Um, but the real problem with cyber insurance right now uh, is it's not clear that there's a federal backstop against catastrophic t terrorism, as there is for other forms of terrorism. Uh, and there really isn't a decent actuarial database yet that allows underwriters uh, to decide on what policy should be. 
Uh, so if, if the government could collect information, statistics, or, or better yet, get someone like uh, Mike uh, to do it, not have a government agency to do it, but somebody, Carnegie Mellon, Dartmouth, someone to collect enough information so that the underwriters in the insurance industry would feel better writing more policy uh, and requiring when they do write policy that companies live up to certain standards and best practices, that would go a long way. How would you have an actuarially sound policy if breaches are not required to be reported? So you, how would not, you re not reported publicly? Gotcha. I think they should be reported, perhaps in a um, anonymized way, to a third party. Mr. Foreman. Well, I think you have to look at uh, a couple factors. First of all, you got to ask what is the market failure here. And uh, we believe that normal market approaches um, wouldn't suggest regulation if there's something holding the companies accountable in the marketplace. In other words, if they lose, if a company loses customers because they're not protecting their security well, then we expect normal marketplace forces to work. And, and I think there's pretty strong evidence of that. If you look at a couple years ago, we had firewalls, we have an had antivirus technology. But look in the growth over the last year and the trends in the marketplace on how to protect against uh, cyber threats. Well, threat management systems and software, and then highly reliable redundant systems that le leverage the architecture of the internet. So it's moved out of the security technology realm into hosting and other architecture tools, companies such as Akamai, growing terrifically fast. So clearly the marketplace will respond. So I give you a couple thoughts on the issue. Uh, first of all, are the issues uh, essentially related to uh, criminal type threats? Uh, those may not be made public for a number of reasons, but that may be something to deal with and look at as a trade-off between how do we associate law enforcement uh, structures, is that right for the Internet age? And the other is what, what do you do about organized cyber terrorism? Uh, it, you have different government roles and responsibilities issues there, and that should basically guide, uh, we believe, the regulatory approach of the question, or the answer to the question of whether regulation is even needed in the first place. The, uh, Mr. Clark and Mr. Vadis uh, both alluded to or specifically said that uh, we, we don't have a centralized mechanism in the federal government for overseeing cybersecurity compliance, cybersecurity uh, coordination and, and collaboration. Uh, so uh, are you satisfied with the current framework that, that calls for its placement in, in homeland security or is it, is it still too diffused between FBI and, and homeland security and, and, and OMB and other agencies? Well, there, there are two parts of the picture I think that you have to look at. First of all, we do spend an awful lot of money. We are the world's largest buyer of information technology. So have we got enough central focus and the right structures in place? I'm, I'm very confident now and I think the data shows we're able to track and measure uh, the gaps in cybersecurity. We're able to hit the cycle time uh, that we're looking for. Um, I don't know that the private sector industries have anything like that. We can focus because we do have uh, a, an organizational structure. So the question is, when you get into the, to the other industries, um, it, should it be dealt with on a industry by industry approach? Should it be dealt with on a company by company approach? And there's a real question on, on what that structure should be. I think that was thoroughly vetted in creation of the infrastructure, uh, of the in, uh, information integration and, and infrastructure assurance under secretariat. It was vetted within the administration, it was vetted within the House and the Senate. Uh, now, one thing that uh, I should correct for the record, uh, the undersecretary is uh, a, uh, a confirmed position, but the assistant secretary that has key responsibilities here is an appointed position, and that person is in his job now, Bob Laskowski, has been there a couple weeks, comes from Coca-Cola, and of course people would say the, the formula for Coke is one of the most protected secrets in, in the world today. <coughs> 
so there's a, there's an interesting background that that person brings. But uh, but again, I, the, the department's only been up for uh, several weeks now, and I think when you see their go forward plan, you'll see how they've integrated things uh, to pull together, building on the successes and giving some innovation to that as well. Mr. Vadis, do you want to comment on that? Well, I, I am hopeful, Mr. Chairman, that, that uh, Mr. Foreman proves to be right and that once the uh, key personnel are in place in the new department that we do see things start to roll. Um, but, I, but I think to be realistic it will take some time because of uh, what I alluded to uh, in terms of the operational personnel not being, uh, not likely to be in place for over a year uh, because there are so many vacant positions now that are responsible for the infrastructure protection responsibilities and intelligence analysis. And, and I would make one other point that, uh, about something that worries me, and that is what appears to be the administration's policy that, that cybersecurity is a subset of critical infrastructure protection as a whole, including physical vulnerabilities of our, of our critical infrastructures. I think there is definitely a logic to that in that we do need to look at the infrastructures um, as a whole and consider all the different vulnerabilities. But the worry I have is that if a, an official or a subset of DHS is looking at both physical and cyber, cyber will always get short shrift, especially in these years so soon after 9-11 when so much focus is on the vulnerability to physical terrorist attack. Uh, and I think we've seen that in prior years as well. When we, when we tried to do both things through the same offices, through the same people, uh, cyber always got uh, less attention than I think it was due. So that's another thing that I think w we need to keep an eye on to make sure that doesn't happen. Mr. Clark, who, when you analyze the threat environment out there, what particular nations or particular non-state actors are out there that have made cybersecurity a priority as, as their way of, of getting at capitalism or the United States or Western civilization or whatever? Well, Mr. Chairman, there's a, there's a classified answer to that on, in terms of what we know about other nations uh, that have created offensive cybersecurity organizations. Uh, suffice it to say, in an open hearing, there are nations, including our own, that have created cybersecurity offensive organizations. Uh, and there are terrorist groups, organized criminal groups that are interested in this. Uh, I'm not very good at predicting the who here. And I think we make a mistake by focusing on the who is going to do it to us. I think rather than focus on the who, we should focus on the what. What are they going to do? And it's, it's real simple. As long as we have major cybersecurity vulnerabilities that would allow someone who doesn't like us to screw up our economy, then someone will. It may not happen this year. We may not be able to guess who it is in advance, but it's a very high probability that as long as we have very well-known major vulnerabilities that are cheaply exploited, somebody will do it. And I don't think the emphasis ought to be on trying to figure out who that is in advance and getting them before they do it, because someone else will do it. Uh, what we should try to do is raise the barrier. Uh, and in answer to your last question about, uh, about DHS and OMB, I think the question answers itself when you ask who is the highest level official in the Department of Homeland Security whose full-time job is cybersecurity? What office in the Department of Homeland Security does nothing but cybersecurity? Who is the highest ranking person in OMB who does nothing but cybersecurity? How many people in OMB the organization to which the Congress has given the full responsibility for cybersecurity in the federal government. How many people in OMB have that as their full-time responsibility? The answers to those questions are pretty frightening, I think. 
Mr. Foreman, you want to answer those questions? <clears throat> well, we have a, uh, an, an interesting uh, change going on in our society. I don't think, and from a policy perspective, um, as it relates to federal IT, uh, we cannot differentiate the work that we need to do in our architectures from cybersecurity. Uh, we, I certainly have spent a lot of time, but I think we as an administration have spent an awful lot of, of time making sure that we get the communications between the CIOs and the cybersecurity community. These are two separated communities that uh, have to talk to each other. So, uh, for example, um, when we have denial of service attacks, we find increasingly over the last few months, people organize over the web. And they will target the White House website because in areas outside of America, people feel that that's similar to attacking the administration. That's the whitehouse.gov website. That's correct. <laughs> uh, as opposed to others that may be uh, out there that I've never uh, known about before. Uh, so, so, uh, so these people will organize and uh, they're known. They'll run advertisements in the newspaper. They'll run advertisements on the internet. Essentially, the characterization will be, come to our website if you want to attack President Bush for some action. And, uh, and the cybersecurity community will be aware of that and never communicate that to the CIO of the White House, the CIO of the Energy Department, um, and, and others. Uh, we have worked pretty hard over the last two months to correct that problem, and the integration of these two communities is absolutely critical. We cannot separate them. And you're satisfied that that integration will occur under the new structure of Homeland Security once they're up and running? Absolutely. In fact, as I uh, pointed out in my oral and put more detail in the written testimony, as it relates to federal cybersecurity, we've had to make that happen. Um, as I pointed out, we've had three major events this year, and we started out with a 90-minute cycle time, and we've been able to shrink that down uh, even more so. But there's the longer-term issue of how we secure the infrastructure. There's the fast response issue of what do we do. And, and to give you a feel, I tend to think of this in three dimensions. Uh, we have literally thousands of vulnerabilities. Anybody who could know all the vulnerabilities and make sure the patches are deployed is uh, truly detail-oriented. And as uh, Dick said, there's software that does that for you. You have to rely on the technology to manage the technology. The second dimension are the threats. There are people out there, some of whom are organized, some of whom will leverage the Internet to organize very rapidly. And the third thing is, what does it mean for the actual technology, your architecture that you have deployed as a department? So an example, uh, we worried and fast responded to the slammer threat. But as you recall, the Congress was affected by this. There was a, uh, a cyber sit-in where people called and used the Internet as a, a way to show their response to the administration's policy in the war in Iraq. Our policy decision on that was that that was not a cybersecurity threat. That was e-democracy moving into the Internet age. Um, the cybersecurity community view on that was that was a cyber threat. Uh, so if we don't meld these two groups together and look at this from the standpoint of the CIO role, as was laid out going back to the Clean Cone Act, um, we won't be able to get that decision properly placed as a policy decision. <coughs> well, cor correct me if I'm, if I'm wrong or if I'm heading in the wrong direction on this, but for, from my perspective, the OMB role would be an internal federal IT management role. Uh, protecting and, and, and preserving the uh, sanctity of, of federal systems, of the federal networks, of containing the costs of a, of a breach that would spread agency-wide or department-wide or government-wide. The role of Homeland Security would be analyzing the threats, uh, detecting as quickly as possible when a, a uh, virus or some other cyber attack has occurred, and then distributing that word 
as quickly as possible to the public and private sector, state, local governments, the remainder of the federal government, and critical infrastructure. And, and so uh, how well is Homeland Security equipped to handle that from, from not from an internal federal IT perspective, but from the external perspective. Yeah. Um, again, a lot of this may may change, but uh, let, let me uh, tell you because there there is uh, an area of overlap between the federal and the external. Um, FedCERC uh, maintains uh, the catalog, if you will, of the vulnerabilities and the patches that are associated with that with fixing that vulnerability. Generally, when we see a threat materialize that we have to respond quickly to, the threat targets a certain vulnerability. And if the patch gets rapidly deployed or if it had already been deployed, there's no impact. And so we've been fairly effective. Uh, certainly this year we've been 100% uh, effective in making sure that when the threat is identified, FedCERC puts out, um, in coordination with the CIO Council, the link to the patch and the characterization of that vulnerability, the threat, et cetera. There's a, a partner organization, uh, the National Infrastructure Protection Center, that was uh, not totally, but the, the key elements moved from the FBI to that same office to integrate this together be uh, better. Uh, they produce a daily report. Um, I expect that that will continue. Again, I don't know that for a fact. We'll see, I think, some innovation there. But that tells you the threats that are current, uh, the patches that are current, hot link, and so forth. And, uh, and so I think that part is, is focusing uh, fairly well on the topical threats. In the area outside of government, the longer term, uh, remediation and maintenance of the architectures is an area where uh, I think there's a big question as to uh, how to proceed. There's a multifaceted approach laid out in the President's uh, National Cyberspace Strategy, and uh, that was thoroughly vetted um, as uh, is in Dick Clark's testimony. Um, so I'm, I'm fairly comfortable we're going to see a good implementation plan for that uh, as Bob has the time to make that work at Department of Homeland Security and they're ready to release their implementation plan for that strategy. I, I know that there has been a great deal of focus on this and, and I know that it's a that it's a daunting task but in in the latest report in 2002 after four solid years of focused specific attention uh, to this issue of, of cybersecurity. We only had three out of 24 agencies uh, that received a report card grade that was better than a D, and 14 of the 24 got an F. Uh, how, how, what, what are we doing wrong? What is, what is Congress's role? I mean, how, how do we, that's just unacceptable, obviously. Yeah. And, and while it doesn't reflect a lack of, um, of effort, on the part of, o of OMB, perhaps, to manage this, it certainly reflect, reflects a lack of success on the part of agencies to improve outcomes. So I'll let you get situated and then answer that. <laughs> uh, I, I uh, share 100% uh, this focus. Uh, first of all, we, we did have differences in um, scores and ratings uh, between um, what uh, Mr. Horn scored the agencies on and how we scored them in 2001. Uh, I will say 2001 was the first year that we actually measured progress and that set the benchmark. So it wasn't until the end of 2001 that we even knew quantitatively how bad it was and subsequent to that put in place a process, these plans of actions and milestones that laid out the workload to fix that. Last year, uh, we had pretty much quarterly oversight for both OMB as well as the Congress. Uh, I'd ask that we maintain that because I think we made a lot of progress. It's documented in the data uh, that uh, we shared in the testimony, uh, some more detailed data we shared with the staff and GAO in the 2002 GIZR report. And we'll be able to see to the agency. But 
the progress from going from 27 percent to 53 percent is 53 percent acceptable? Absolutely not. By the end of this year, we believe it's a slight stretch goal, but with the constant vigilance, we get up to 80 percent. Uh, on a couple of these security measures and 100 percent on putting in place a process. That's going to take a lot of continued oversight throughout this year to get there. But at that point, we're talking about significantly improved security. And I would put that up against any company, and you'll find very few that hit those benchmarks. Well, just very, very briefly, would you put that up against any other country? Um, I think that there are a couple. I haven't really thought about that. Uh, but uh, certainly our, our view is that the U U.S. spends the most. Uh, we have to protect our citizens and the, and the information. And so uh, we're going to be the best, uh, not because we're competing with other countries, but because it's the right thing to do for the Americans. Mr. Clark, Mr. Vadis, what, what other countries out there or ahead of us on protecting critical infrastructure from cyber attack? Uh, the good news, Mr. Chairman, is that nobody is ahead of us. Um, the bad news is that we're pretty bad. Uh, and uh, I disagree with Mark uh, in saying that the federal government is as good as any company. Uh, that's just not true. The private sector is way ahead of the federal government. So who, who do I need to bring, and I don't mean to interrupt, I'm going to let you finish. What company, CEO, CIO, do I need to bring into our next hearing? Rhonda McLean from Bank of America uh, will tell you, uh, if you ask her the right questions, of how she's doing it. She's doing a great job. Bank of America is better than any federal government agency in terms of its IT security. That's true of most banks, major banks in the United States. Uh, they're doing a much better job. Why? Because they've got someone who is a senior person who is full-time in charge of IT security. I didn't hear in Mark's answer uh, who is the senior OMB official who is full-time in charge of IT security and nothing else? I didn't hear who in the Department of Homeland Security is in charge of cybersecurity and nothing else full-time. I didn't hear how many people we have in OMB full-time working on cybersecurity. Uh, I think there's another big mistake we're making. Uh, and that is we're trying to get the departments to do this themselves, essentially. And with all due respect to civil servants, I was one for 30 years, you're not going to get this done without outsourcing it. There is a real reluctance in federal departments to outsource IT security. But there is a solution. Take the Department of Labor, take the Department of Agriculture, and have it contract to any of the big integrators um, or any of the IT security firms and then hold them responsible and fine them in terms of their contract if there's not performance. Instead of just bringing the CIO of labor or agriculture up here and berating them that they got an F again, have them outsource it to a company that has penalties in its contract if that grade is an F again. Does the law currently preclude them from doing that? No, it does not. Mr. Vadis. I agree 100% with, with, with what which one, <laughs> Mr. Clark or Mr. Foreman? With Mr. Clark. Okay. Yeah, I, I, think, uh, I think he's exactly right on the, the lack of, of sufficient high-level personnel devoted to this issue. I think it will always get short shrift if there's not. And I think, I think the idea that we need a hammer to truly make progress within the agencies is also exactly right. I, I served in the FBI for a, number of, for a few years uh, and lived within an infrastructure that, um, despite some efforts over those years to improve it, never really got anywhere. And I think that's a case example of how not to manage uh, information systems in a, in a crucial federal agency. So sort of a recurring theme in these e-government and all of our subcommittee hearings that we have a cultural challenge, a human capital challenge throughout the federal government in, in dealing with this issue. Uh, we could go on. I have a second panel, and uh, I, I want to thank all of you for your very insightful and, and thoughtful testimony. Uh, I will give each of you one minute to, to say whatever is on your heart that I didn't ask you about or to rebut or 
and give a counterpoint to something that somebody else has said. Uh, we want to be as thorough and as fair as possible. So uh, we'll begin with Mr. Foreman. You have uh, one minute to say whatever you'd like to say to, to conclude. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I just want to congratulate you again for this hearing. Uh, oversight of progress has been and will continue to be uh, incredibly important to our success. I'll pledge to you that the administration is focused on this all the way to the highest levels, that we're holding deputy secretaries and secretaries accountable. Uh, and I'd ask for your cooperation and support in doing the same. You have it. Mr. Vadis. I think from our testimony, you you've, can gather that um, how the DHS evolves is going to be critical. Uh, especially at the operational level. So I think one thing that, that this committee could fruitfully do is keep the, the heat on to make sure that they devote the, the requisite attention to cybersecurity uh, and that they don't let it get lost in the shuffle of dealing with physical terrorism and uh, reducing our vulnerability to physical terrorist attacks, uh, making sure that they hire people as quickly as possible, that the consolidation actually achieves the promises that have been made about new efficiencies uh, among all these entities that had, were formerly separate. But I think without some heat from Congress, it won't be done nearly quickly enough or well enough. Mr. Clark. Mr. Chairman, just again to thank you for uh, your recognition of this issue. And to echo Mike Vadis, you personally have a great opportunity here to be a pain in the rear end to the administration, and I encourage you to do that. It's very kind of you, Mr. Clark. <laughs> the first panel is dismissed. Stand in recess for about two minutes while we set up the second panel. like to welcome our panelists uh, in the, and our second panel of witnesses. Uh, as is the custom with the committee, we swear in our witnesses, so please rise and raise your right hand and repeat after me. Do you swear that the testimony you will give before this subcommittee will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth to help you guide? Yes. Note for the record that all of the witnesses have responded in the affirmative. We welcome you to the subcommittee. Uh, you've had uh, an opportunity to hear the testimony of the first panel and some of the interchange. Uh, following the ladies first rule, we will begin with Ms. McLean, uh, who has received a warm introduction already and, and very high praise in the first panel. Uh, Rhonda McLean is the Senior Vice President and Director of Corporate Information Security for the Bank of America. Ms. McLean joined Bank of America in 1996 as the Director of Corporate Information Security and is responsible for providing global leadership for information security policy, procedures, risk management, security technology implementation, cyber investigations and forensics, and general information security awareness. In addition, she is responsible for enterprise business continuity planning and the company's regional recovery centers. In May of 2002, the Department of the Treasury appointed Ms. McLean as the private sector coordinator for the financial services industry, public-private partnership on critical infrastructure protection and homeland security. She will act in concert with Treasury's private sector liaison to draw together industry initiatives related to critical infrastructure protection and homeland security. In addition, she was elected to the Board of Directors for the Partnership for Critical Infrastructure Security, which brings together leaders from across multiple critical sectors, such as energy, telecom, finance, etc. We welcome you to the, to the uh, panel and recognize you for five minutes for your opening statement. Thank you, Chairman Putman, and thank you for inviting me here today uh, to testify at the hearing. I'm very honored to speak on behalf of the financial services sector and my role as the Department of Treasury appointed sector co private sector coordinator for critical infrastructure protection. Um, in listening to the testimony this morning, something struck me that I just wanted to 
actually put into this statement, and that is that this, this challenge that we have before us takes vision, leadership, execution, and accountability. And I want to touch on those things today with the information that I provide you about the financial services industry's involvement in critical infrastructure protection and the current work of our financial services sector coordinating council and discuss some of the opportunities where I think government and industry really can partner to address some of the challenge we have in facing securing our cyberspace. The administration's uh, national strategy to secure cyberspace identified the critical infrastructures as consisting of physical and cyber assets of the public and private sector and institutions. Through the basic approach of security, though the basic approach of security must fundamentally address people, process, and technology aspects of the infrastructure, I do want to iterate that there is no single solution to this challenge. Creating the appropriate balance of these elements is based on an operational risk management consideration that addresses the critical nature of the systems as well as the exposures that, exposures that they can be subjected to. I'd like to talk about how the sector's critical infrastructure protection efforts and specifically about our council. At the time of my appointment, there was no integrated entity that could represent the entire financial services sector. Individual associations were actively and effectively working on their members' behalfs and provided much leadership for our critical infrastructure protection efforts. To ensure coordination across the sector with the public sector's support and encouragement and with the leadership of the Department of Treasury, we formed the Financial Services Sector Coordinating Council. Today, we have 24 organizations consisting of key national exchanges, clearing organizations, trade associations in banking, securities, bond, and insurance segments of our industry, and we are working together to prove, improve the critical infrastructure protection for our sector, as well as others on which we depend. Through our council members, we engage nearly all financial service sector entities. Let me highlight uh, three of the five strategic areas where we have focus. The first area is in the uh, area of information dissemination and information sharing. Our goal is to ensure that a universal service to disseminate trusted and timely information will be made available to all sector participants. Secondly, crisis and response management needs to be implemented. When events occur with broad sector or national impact, a planned and adopted approach for communicating and responding as a sector, including coordination with government enti entities, is the focus of this particular effort. Thirdly, we are leading the sector's efforts to revise our, the financial se services sector, national strategy component in response to the two national strategies released in February by the President. We believe this is our opportunity to, to define strategic as well as tactical, actionable, and measurable actions as part of our sector-wide critical infrastructure and homeland security efforts. In my chairperson role for the Financial Services Sector Coordinating Council, I work closely with the lead agency, the Department of Treasury, and specifically the Office of Critical Infrastructure Protection and Compliance, which was created by the Treasury Assistant Secretary Wayne Abernathy and led by Deputy Assistant Secretary Michael Dawson. Together, they lead the Financial and Banking Information Infrastructure Committee. That council is really the public side of what I would call the public-private partnership. It is through council members and our government partners' cooperative efforts that we are able to maximize our resources and achieve our objectives to ensure protection of our critical infrastructures to the benefit of the economy and to the financial services customers. Let me transition to the discussion to some opportunities to a few areas of importance to continuing the progress that has been made both by the government and the private sector. First, let's talk a little bit more about the information analysis and information uh, infrastructure protection. The need for synergy between information analysis and infrastructure protection has clearly been recognized in the assignment of those responsibles to the undersecretary within the Department of Homeland Security. 
We expect this to provide a much more robust alerting, threat warning, and information flow from the public sector based on the vast resources that they have been made available through their integration. Secondly, is understanding the threat. Based on the government's visibility of threats to the private sector, a clear understanding of the protection needs must exist between the public and the private sector. Gaps between the private sector's protection efforts and the government's view of the necessary protections must be defined and clearly understood. There may be situations where, unknown to the private sector, nor normal business practices now not really adequately address the level of threat understood by the government. Where market focus do not, prov do not provide the appropriate incentives to provide these protections, augmentation of market mechanisms such as incentives may be appropriate. Thirdly is product security. Because the private sector mainly employs commercial products, services and software to implement cybersecurity protection and monitoring. Those efforts that improve the security of such products have broad benefit. As a sector, we work closely with our vendors to achieve higher levels of security. The BITS, or the Bankers Information Technology Secretariat, who is a member of our coordinating council, has implemented a product certification program as a prime example of our industry's efforts in this area. And finally, the voluntary sharing of threat and incident information. We must continue to encourage processes that accommodate companies' voluntary sharing of sensitive information, such as the provisions outlined in the Homeland Security Act of 2002. In closing, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee, we believe the strong public-private sector partnership that is emerging is the right approach. And it is finally with that vision, leadership, and the execution. Uh, we believe that we can continue to make progress in this important area. Thank you very much. Uh, now recognize Tom Pike as Chief Information Officer of the U.S. Department of Commerce. Mr. Pike is responsible for guiding the department's effective use of information technology and managing the department's IT resources with an annual budget of over one and a half billion dollars. His responsibilities include IT policy, planning and capital investment review, IT security and critical infrastructure protection, IT architecture, information quality, e-government, information dissemination through the Internet and the next generation Internet, and oversight of IT operations. He has been a senior manager of information technology in the Commerce Department for over 30, 30 years most recently serving as CIO and Director for High Performance Computing and Communications of the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration and Director of the GLOBE program. Welcome. You're recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I am pleased to be here this morning to share with the subcommittee a summary of the actions that the Commerce Department has taken over the last two years to strengthen our information security posture. The department's actions to improve its management of information security started at the top. Secretary Don Evans, in June 2001, directed all commerce agency heads to focus their personal attention on establishing information technology or IT security as a priority. He directed them to allocate the necessary resources to ensure that the department's data and information systems are adequately protected against risks resulting from misuse or unauthorized access. This important action ensures accountability for IT security by all of the department's senior managers. And both the secretary, as well as Deputy Secretary Sam Bodman, have emphasized this personal responsibility of commerce agency heads as they have communicated with these senior managers in the department about the importance of IT security over the past two years. The secretary also instituted a department-wide IT management restructuring plan that empowered the department's CIOs by providing them with the necessary authority to manage IT security as well as, as well as other aspects of information technology planning and operations and IT capital investment review. As the department CIO, I issue IT security policy and provide IT security guidance to the commerce agency heads and to the Commerce Agency CIOs. I participate in the annual review of the performance of each of the Commerce Agency CIOs, which bolsters the authority that my staff and I have at the department <coughs> level as we oversee the, the management of the expenditure of the $1.5 billion in information technology uh, 
uh, over each year uh, on a department-wide basis. This $1.5 billion, by the way, includes the resources that we devote to protecting our systems and information assets through our department-wide IT security program. We have issued in this past January a comprehensive department-wide IT security policy, as well as minimum standards for management, operational and technical controls, and other key aspects of implementing this policy. We also issued a password management policy and a remote access security policy. Policy implementation guides have been issued that, that address critical corrective action plans to identify and correct security weaknesses, to document security and privacy in the IT capital asset planning process, and to maintain complete inventories of all of our systems relative to their security status. The department instituted a compliance monitoring process in 2002, through which we determined Commerce Agency compliance with department IT security policies, standards, and guidance. This process includes tests of all management, operational, and technical controls, including tests of systems and networks to ensure that they are adequately protected against unauthorized access. We also established an IT security training program through which every commerce employee and every contractor employee has received IT security <coughs> awareness training and is receiving updated training every year. Specialized training for IT security personnel, managers, and system administrators is also being provided. The department has established a computer incident response capability that supports actions to protect systems and data when incidents do occur and facilitates proper reporting of incidents. A department-wide IT security alert capability has also been established that assures 24 by 7 transmittal of IT security alerts throughout the department and activation of Commerce Agency IT security emergency mobilization plans as appropriate. Especially since the Commerce Department has been coming from behind as it has implemented this comprehensive IT security program, numerous corrective actions have been identified that need special attention to correct IT security weaknesses. A department-wide database of needed corrective actions has been created and is being maintained. It includes every IT security action that has resulted from GAO and Commerce Office of Inspector General audits, as well as actions that have resulted from department IT security compliance reviews and from self-assessments by the Commerce agencies themselves. We expect to complete by this September all of the corrective actions that were opening open at the beginning of FY2003. Over 74% of these actions are already completed. We expect to have completed by the end of this fiscal year all but two of the over 200 corrective actions that have been identified during this fiscal year. The top level measure we use to manage IT security across the department is what we call IT program maturity. By the end of fiscal 03, we expect that every commerce agency will operate, be operating at at least level three maturity, which requires that all IT systems have implemented policies and procedures. We have identified our national critical and mission critical assets and the IT system components of those assets. And we expect to have certification and accreditation for full operation of these systems completed by the end of this fiscal year. I would like to tell you very briefly how we are doing against some of the performance measures that Mark Foreman introduced in his testimony this morning in which he provided government-wide data. At Commerce, we have assessed 96% of our systems for risk, 90% of our systems have contingency plans, 92% are certified and accredited, and 98% of our systems have up-to-date IT security plans. Thank you for this opportunity to tell you about what we have done in the Commerce Department to improve our information security posture. We have come a long way in these last two years, and we are working hard to complete the next steps that are essential to provide adequate protection of our data and systems. We understand, however, that IT security is a never-ending process, and we are committed to maintaining a high level of vigilance to assure that the department is able to carry out its mission without disruption caused by cyber threats. Thank you, Mr. Pike. This time, the subcommittee recognizes Robert Dacey. Mr. Dacey is currently Director of Information Security Issues at the U.S. General Accounting Office. His responsibilities include evaluating information systems, security in federal agencies and corporations, including the development of related methodologies, 
assessing the federal infrastructure for managing information security, evaluating the federal government's efforts to protect our nation's private and public critical infrastructure from cyber threats, and identifying best security practices at leading organizations in promoting their adoption by federal agencies. Previously, Mr. Dacey led GAO's annual audits of the consolidated financial statements of the U.S. government audits, I think, which revealed about the same grades as they've been getting on their IT scorecards. GAO's financial audit quality assurance efforts, including methodology and training and other GAO financial statement audit efforts, including HHS and the IRS. Welcome to the subcommittee. You're recognized for five minutes. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, Mr. Clay, I'm pleased to be here today to discuss the challenges our nation faces concerning federal information security and critical infrastructure protection. CIP or critical, <coughs> excuse me, involves activities that enhance the security of our nation's cyber and physical, public and private infrastructures that are essential to national security, economic security, and or public health and safety. As you requested, I will briefly summarize my written statement, which provides details on the status and progress of efforts to address these challenges. We have identified and made numerous recommendations over the last several years concerning federal information security and CIP challenges that need to be addressed. For each of these challenges, improvements have been made and continuing efforts are in progress. However, much more is needed to fully address them. These challenges include, number one, addressing pervasive weaknesses in federal information security. Our analysis of audit and evaluation reports in November of last year continued to show significant pervasive weaknesses in federal unclassified computer systems for all 24 major agencies reviewed that put critical operations and assets at risk. The implementation of GISRA continues to play a significant role in the improvement of federal information security. Second year agency GISRA reports indicate agency progress, provide comparative performance information, and an improved performance baseline, and highlight areas where additional efforts are necessary. The administration has taken important actions to address information security, such as integrating it into the President's Management Agenda Scorecard. The successful implementation of FISMA, which permanently authorizes and strengthens GISRA requirements, is essential to sustaining these agency efforts to identify and correct significant weaknesses. As FISMA is implemented, it will be important to continue efforts to certify, accredit, and regularly test systems to identify and correct vulnerabilities in all agency systems. <coughs> Also, to complete development and test contingency plans to ensure that critical systems can resume after an emergency. Three, to validate agency reported information through independent evaluation. And four, to achieve other FISMA requirements. The second major challenge is the development of a national CIP strategy. A more complete strategy is still needed that addresses specific roles, responsibilities, and relationships for all CIP entities that clearly defines interim objectives and milestones and sets time frames for achieving them and establishes appropriate performance measures in a monitoring process. The President's National Homeland Security Strategy, the President's Cyber and Physical CIP Strategies, and the Homeland Security Act call for a comprehensive national infrastructure plan. The third major challenge is improving information sharing on threats and vulnerabilities. Information sharing needs to be enhanced both within the federal government and between the federal government and the private sector and state and local governments. The President's national strategies identify partnering with non-federal entities as a major initiative. Information sharing and analysis centers continue to play a key role in this strategy. The fourth major challenge is improving analysis and warning capabilities. More robust warning and analysis capabilities are needed to identify threats and provide timely warnings. Such capabilities need to address both cyber and physical threats. Again, the President's national strategies call for major initiatives in this area. The fifth challenge is encouraging non-federal entities to increase their CIP efforts. The federal government needs to assess whether additional incentives, such as grants or regulations, are needed to encourage non-federal entities to increase their efforts to implement suggested CIP activities. The Homeland Security Act and the President's national strategies acknowledge the need to address many of these challenges. However, much work remains to effectively respond to them. Until a comprehensive 
and coordinated strategy is developed, our nation risks not having a consistent and appropriate structure to deal with the growing threat of attacks on its federal systems and on its critical infrastructures. Mr. Chairman, Mr. Clay, this concludes my oral statement. I'd be pleased to answer any questions at this time. Thank you very much, Mr. Dacey. We appreciate all of the uh, remarks of the panel, and I will recognize Mr. Clay for his questions. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Uh, Dacey, uh, Mr. Clark suggested the GAO should develop the capacity to give Congress real-time security reports on all executive agencies, um, computer system. Is GAO prepared to undertake this responsibility? Um, <laughs> Not, not as, to, as of today. Um, I would say that we have been doing reviews, and in fact, uh, what Mr. Pike didn't say prior to his appointment as CIO, we had done a review at Commerce, and I'm very pleased to hear of the progress they've made in the last two years since that. Uh, we certainly have a suite of tools, uh, and there are tools available commercially uh, that can be used to assess security and systems, to scan them, so to speak. Uh, we use them. Uh, other people in the commercial sector use them to do testing of networks. So in terms of technologies, uh, those types of systems are available. Now, what we run into routinely when we go to agencies is we have to figure out how to run them on their systems. and how to interface and how to use them on their networks and how their networks are configured, which, which actually takes a lot amount of our time to do that. So I, I guess the question of active monitoring, uh, GAO has and continues to support that agencies should be regularly monitoring their systems for these kind of vulnerabilities. And there are thousands. I, I heard a number before, but there are literally thousands of these vulnerabilities. I, I do know that NASA has undertaken for the last year or so a project to actually assess all of their networks for a subset of vulnerabilities, 20 or 30 odd vulnerabilities, I forget the exact number, uh, that they actively re re, uh, report on to agency management in terms of whether those vulnerabilities existed. They have metrics and measurements, performance measures uh, against that. So at least with respect to a subset, I think it's been demonstrated that agencies can do that. Uh, I'll leave it to uh, Congress and others to decide who will do that, uh, but, but certainly it is very possible to be done. Okay. It's, uh, it's my understanding that the National Inst Institute of Standards and Technology is about to release a draft of security standards required under FISMA. Uh, have you reviewed those standards? And if not, uh, what, are you, what are your plans for reviewing them? Um, FISMA required NIST to develop uh, basically risk levels and uh, minimum security standards for each risk level. Uh, separately, as part of the Cyber Research and Development Act, NIST is required to develop checklists for how settings on technologies that are widely used or will be widely used in the federal government. Uh, FISMA made as one of its requirements that NIST consult with GAO on this issue, and they have consulted uh, with us uh, uh, thus far. They are still actively developing those standards. Uh, what we have done is to uh, basically look at what we use in terms of our audit process. What do we audit against and trying to ensure that their standards would at least include at a minimum the kind of things that we uh, look for when we do our audits. So that process is taking place uh, and, and I can't say exactly when those standards will be developed but they are intended I understand to be uh, developed for public exposure and comment. Well, thank you. Uh, Mr. Pike, in the uh, last panel, Mr. Clark suggested that IT security be contracted to private firms uh, with penalties on the contractor for breaches in security. I'd like to hear your thoughts on that suggestion. Mr. Clay, I respectfully disagree with that particular recommendation. Although I think that there's plenty of room for us to outsource the uh, many of the capabilities we need to have a complete and effective IT security program. Uh, as we've done in commerce from the secretary on down, I think it's very important to have personal accountability by our, of our managers for the management of IT security. I also think it's important to have uh, a high level uh, individual or individuals responsible for IT security within the organization. When I was the CIO of the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, I raised IT security to one of the top le to the top level within the CIO office. At the Commerce Department, uh, we have IT security and critical infrastructure protection at the top level within the Commerce CIO office. Uh, I should say, with uh, I should add, with full-time individuals responsible for each of these uh, each of these important functions. 
Uh, so I don't think that uh, the responsibility for IT security within any federal agency can be delegated by outsourcing. But I do think, especially since we all face a shortfall of the um, uh, scarce resources necessary to keep on top of IT security, I do think that it is uh, 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 an excellent idea to take advantage of outsourcing to get the job done. Mr. Pike, let me also ask you about the Census Bureau. Do they have an enterprise architecture for the modernization of, of its geographic system, and has your office reviewed that architecture? Yes, the Census, the Census Bureau does have an architecture, and their overall architecture for the agency as a whole and for conducting, moving ahead toward the decen next decennial census is a part of the overall enterprise architecture that we have for the entire Department of Commerce. What is it, the, the cost of, of this modernization project? Or, or I'll have know? to get you, you're talking about the census modernization? Yes. Uh, if, if, uh, if, if I may, sir, I'd like to provide that, that number for you for the record. That'll be fine. Thank you. Mr. McLean, uh, last question. Has the, has the banking industry been concerned about sharing information with the federal government, and does the FOIA exclusion passed as part of Homeland Security address those concerns? That's a very great question. Uh, <laughs> the financial services sector as a whole really believes strongly that FOIA protection is critical to our ability to share information uh, with the federal government. Keeping uh, being able to share that information without fear of disclosure of specifics, I think, is very, very important. So keeping that FOIA protection. Another aspect of that, if we go back to Y2K and the way that Y2K protection with the FOIA and there's also liability protection, is another aspect that we feel is important. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Clay. I'd like to follow up on that question with Ms. McLean. The, what would be the threshold of breach or the, the threshold of cyber threat or a cyber attack that would trigger the need for a public disclosure to the customer or client whose information is jeopardized? I'd like to say it kind of happens naturally. Uh, uh, we do share information today uh, as part of our uh, information sharing and analysis center. We have an FSI SAC where today we share information among institutions. We also are required by law and by regulation to uh, notify the government of any major breach through our SAR program at the financial institution level. Uh, I think making things public uh, really, it, it just really depends on, I think, uh, whether or not there is that need that would assist us in helping resolve the issue. Uh, I don't think that it is conducive to just every time there is a breach to make that public. Uh, I think one of the metrics, and I heard you say earlier in the very beginning about the increased numbers of incidents occurring, or I actually think that's a positive metric. I think we should be looking for those reports to go up, but I don't think you necessarily need to make those public in order to work the issues and just determine what vulnerabilities need to be addressed. But, but what is, is there a current federal law or regulation that requires a customer or client whose information may have been breached to be notified, and if there is not, what is your company's policy? Yes. From a privacy perspective, and in the state of California, I think that was mentioned earlier, that if there's a breach where public or private information is compromised, you are required to notify that customer. That's different than going on CNN and making that public. Uh, it's all for, so for the protection of those customers that I do believe the customer should be notified, but not necessarily make all that information public uh, because it does violate the privacy from another aspect. Ms. Mr. Pike, the, um, your role as CIO of, of Commerce, uh, you have oversight for critical infra infrastructure protection, is that correct? That's correct. Not just with, not just within the department itself, but within 
the infrastructures that are within the jurisdiction of the department. I have responsibility for the critical infrastructure within the department. I'm okay. the critical infrastructure assurance officer. So if there is a substantial cyber threat uh, on a on an industry within the regulation of the Department of Commerce, uh, are you the first one notified or is someone in Homeland Security the first one notified? I'm notified only when there's a threat or possible threat to our systems and data, not to the not to the private, not to the sectors of industry that we relate to or or interact with. And my understanding is that uh, that's where the Department of Homeland Security comes in, and um, uh, they're one of the sources of alerts to us about a possible threat. And uh, as Mr. Foreman mentioned, we've uh, received three uh, very helpful alerts uh, fairly recently that uh, we and the other agencies across government have been able to react to. And I would hope that those uh, kinds of alerts are made available to the private sector as well. The um, <clears throat> Ms. McLean, one of the recurring themes today has been that there, there's a high level of, of uh, reluctance to compel the private sector to to report, and and also there's also some tremendous concern about increasing the regulatory role in setting minimum standards. What, what are your feelings on, on the minimum standards and, and, and the approach of regulation? How do we incent that in the private sector so that we have the information that we need and, and we're getting the results that we need uh, without, without an overreaching hand in, 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 from a regulatory approach? Well, today, our, our particular sector, the financial services sector, is highly regulated. So in some ways, we are already the beneficiary of having some of those guidelines in place. So, so there are a number of regulations today. Um, I think it was mentioned the Gramm-Leach-Bliley Act is one of those regulations which incent, actually, or, or require you to put in additional controls. Uh, the, the second part of that question, I think, really on the um, h how do we make that process, should we make that process uh, and do more of that, I really don't think is conducive to actually getting companies to put those controls in place. I think risk management in most companies, especially in the financial sector, we are in the business of selling trust. So it is to, to our advantage to really provide secure services to our customers. Uh, so the customers demand that. And so there is a market force that really is at the heart of everything we do. We do it because it makes good business sense. We also do it, uh, and the check processes are in place, if you will, through the regulatory agencies who oversee us. Did you, uh, did, did you agree with the recommendation of the first panel that perhaps the way to get at publicly traded corporations is to have a certified audit process that's reflected uh, in, a, in a report to the SEC? I do agree with that, and we do that to an extent today within the financial services sector. I think that it, that would be an effective means, and you're looking more at an effective program versus regulating that program. One of the challenges that has come up is that a, a, a number of the issues we deal with are not as much technological challenges as they are human challenges or cultural challenges. How are you or others in the private sector held accountable for protecting your infrastructure from, from security breaches? Well, my whole job at, at Bank of America is, is to provide that leadership, that vision, that leadership, and I mentioned execution and accountability. I think those are four core things that have to be in place for any effective program. I think within the financial services sector, the way that we have organized with the associations is to provide that leadership and guidance to, to all the financial sector so that we are consistently doing it. The other key to this, I think, is the outreach opportunities because we are very interdependent on other sectors, such as telecommunications and ener energy, uh, and our government partners. 
the Federal Reserve Bank, other people that we have interdependencies with. So making sure that we, everyone uh, within that uh, link of chain, if you will, those those chains, the links in the chains are all doing those right things. I think the leadership around those best practices and expectations that we have are really critical to having a, a, a cohesive, integrated program. So let me give you a ver the version of what I asked Mr. <coughs> Pike. If, if you get a report mm -hmm. that there is something uh, very suspicious going on, something that's raising red flags in, in your infrastructure protection systems, is your first instinct to call the Comptroller General or the Federal Reserve or Homeland Security? My first instinct is to call our crisis management hotline together, which brings together all of our institutions, which includes our regulators who are a part of that process, and that is part of what the Council has put in place. Uh, so having that blast message, if you will, which goes out to multiple different avenues so that we ensure that we get everybody on the phone would be the first thing that we would do. And, and, and I would assume that that would probably be replicated throughout the different sectors that uh, the power company's first re response would be to notify FERC or DOE, telecom, their equivalent uh, agency or department of jurisdiction, it, it makes you wonder at what point it finally gets to the people who are in charge of that, which would be Homeland Security. Mr. Dacey, uh, what's, the, what's the biggest failure, the, the biggest obstacle that you found in the failure of the federal government to, to have adequate information security, and is it a human challenge or a technological challenge? Uh, most of the issue really relates, I, I think, to a human challenge. The, we have many technologies to monitor and manage these systems, and I think it's a matter of, of getting the right amount of attention, focus, responsibility, and accountability in place. Uh, what we have now uh, is a situation where some agencies have done better than others. If you look at our testimony, our written testimony, there are a lot of charts that summarize some of the gifts we're reporting for the second year. Uh, and some agencies uh, are reporting statistics such as Mr. Pike that are, that, are, that are quite high and others that are low. And I think the issue is really focusing in on uh, what, are, what are the reasons why some of these agencies are doing better than others. Um, there's no silver bullet to any of this, but one of the things that uh, Mr. Pike referred to earlier is the fact that he has responsibility for establishing information security standards and monitoring those and maintaining accountability for people to implement those throughout the agency. Uh, in many of the agencies uh, we've looked at, that has not always been the case. Uh, the CIO at the agency level has certain responsibilities, uh, but oftentimes the uh, component parts of the agency have autonomy to develop and establish their networks and their security. And in those environments, if you have a situation where one component uh, has weak security, that can jeopardize the rest of the agency, uh, considering in most cases those systems are interlinked and oftentimes trusted so that uh, getting access access to one can readily get you access to another. So I think those are the, the, the primary issues. Uh, I think OMB laid those out in their first year gives a report and are continuing to work those issues. Uh, if you look at the numbers, again, there, there's definitely progress being shown. But if you look at some of them, uh, you'll see that uh, there's a lot of information we don't have yet. Uh, we talk about a process for managing vulnerabilities, but in many cases, uh, systems haven't really been fully tested or analyzed to identify the vulnerabilities that exist so that it can be fixed. So there's a, a process here that needs to take place. But certainly the GISRA and now FISMA, uh, I think, have been landmark changes in the way in which information security has been viewed by, by the agencies. The last part, which was referred to a little earlier, is research and development. I think that's key, that that continue in a cohesive fashion so that we can make sure that we're developing the best technologies we have to defend against cyber threats. Certainly the, the, the current in uh, IT management and, and procurement has been away from the stove, the traditional stovepipe system and, and the inherent redundancies and, and duplication, but presumably a, a positive uh, benefit of those stovepipes and of those redundancies is a, some limited protection from a cyber security threat as a result of 
for all the consequences of not being able to communicate with, with one another, the benefits have been that, that you had some kind of a, of a firewall there. Would, would you comment on, on that a little bit as we press these agencies to tear down stovepipes? What consequence does that have for cybersecurity? Um, I, I think um, many, if not all, the agencies have, have really gotten to a point where they're, they're highly internetworked within themselves. And, and I think based upon the studies we've done where we've actually gone in and assessed security, uh, we've generally found that, uh, again, the uh, systems are uh, fairly trusted. Uh, one of the concerns that we have expressed is not only the impact of an external party coming in, but also internal parties are a threat uh, to security as well. Uh, when you've got tens of thousands of users in some of these systems, uh, you really have to be careful to manage that. What we haven't seen in many systems is uh, once we're able to get in, we do, we do try to, as part of our audits, break into systems both internally and externally uh, and, and are generally successful. Uh, but when we do that, we typically find that uh, we can use that access to gain privileges throughout the entire network and other places. So, so to some extent, I think removing the stovepipes in terms of information security is critical uh, or you're going to continue to have that. What we haven't seen is really an effective segmenting of networks so that uh, if one is broken into, you, you can't get access to other parts. That's certainly technologically possible. And if you follow through FISMA and, the, and the, the idea that there will be different risk level systems, you're going to have to come up with a strategy on segmenting them so you, you have one high level risk system doesn't connect to a low level risk system without appropriate protections. And Mr. Pike, uh, we've heard from Ms. McLean on the accountability measures that are in place in the private sector to ensure uh, an appropriate commitment to cybersecurity. What has Secretary Evans empowered you to do uh, that has made the Department of Commerce a model for success in a situation where everyone else is pretty well mired in failure? Mr. Chairman, one of the things he's done has been not just to empower me as CIO to do my job and, and do it in a full way, but he's empowered the uh, and mandated that the commerce agency heads, the, the undersecretaries, assistant secretaries, and directors of the individual bureaus or operating units within the department, that they give their time and attention to, to computer security and to protecting the infrastructure. And this has opened the way for my staff and I to be able to provide policy guidance, to provide direction, and have it received well. It's opened the way for us to work with the commerce agencies and have them be responsive when we have an incident that uh, we need to, to handle. Uh, I, I might mention with regard to the uh, uh, something you asked me about earlier, uh, in terms of incident handling, that we've had at least one incident that uh, um, that I'm aware of, uh, that uh, where we had an intrusion that we reported, and when we, we have an intrusion that we detect, we report the incident to FedSERP, to the Federal Computer Incident Response Center, which is now part of the Department of Homeland Security, and that has resulted that particular incident resulted in a government-wide alert, and I believe an alert that went out to the private sector as well, um, uh, with regard to the, the appropriate measures to take to respond to that particular particular threat. Thank you, Mr. Pike. I want to thank all of our witnesses from both panels for their outstanding testimony and their ability to help us understand what is a very complex issue. Uh, it's clear that the time to act is now. Uh, we have not made the progress that we need to make to be as prepared as we should be as a nation, and we must all work together to protect our nation from what could certainly be a digital disaster. I want to thank Mr. Clay for his input and his support of our efforts on the subcommittee and uh, recognizing that we weren't able to, uh, to answer all of the questions that people had. I'd, uh, I'll keep the record open for two weeks for submitted questions and answers. Mr. Dacey, Mr. Pike, Ms. McLean, we appreciate what you do. We appreciate your service to the subcommittee. And with that, we stand adjourned.
just ahead here on C-SPAN 2. Members of